207. That's the number of the ambulance Steve will be driving today. He's an ambulance man. Pat works with him. She's an ambulance woman. Today, she'll be travelling inside the ambulance with the patients. Steve is testing the two-way radio. The Metro Falcon 5 routine test call over. The radio is the link between the ambulance and headquarters. Oh, Roger, receiving you strength five. Thank you. Pat checks that everything she may need for a patient is in the ambulance. Steve makes sure the warning lights and two-tone horn are working. Pat helps him check the lights at the back of the ambulance. This is the control room at ambulance headquarters. Someone is dialing 999. Emergency, which service please? Ambulance please. A red light flashes on the switchboard. Ambulance service, can I help you? My friend's fallen downstairs. You hurt his head. Hello, what address would this be from? 47 Holloway Road. 47. Now, how are you spelling that, please? H O double L O W A Y. Holloway Road. And which district is that? The operator writes down the address the ambulance must go to and what it's needed for. Yes, well, what has happened? She checks all the details carefully. Is this a man or a boy who's fallen? It's a boy. Yeah. Pat and Steve are having a cup of tea in the restroom. There's a special telephone in the restroom. It rings when an ambulance is needed. The operator at headquarters tells Pat where she and Steve must take the ambulance. Pat writes it down on her worksheet. As they set off, Pat tells the control room. Falcon 5, mobile 47, Holloway Road, over. Roger, Falcon 5, Metro Stunning Road. Steve drives fast but safely. The flashing lights warn the traffic to get out of the way. Sometimes they use the horn to clear the road. They've nearly reached the address they've been given. Steve has to wait for the other traffic to pass before he can pull up outside the house. Yeah. Okay. Let me go and have a look, then. He's in here. Hello. The patient is lying at the bottom of the stairs. Fell upstairs. Do you want to pop that under his head? Look, look. I'll send my Steve Bruce. You've got a blue black eye in the morning, won't you? Hey. Did he hurt anywhere else? Just my leg. Just your leg, yeah. Did he go from the top to the bottom? Yes, it's from the top. All the way down. Where's your mum? She's at work. And you're just you here? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah. That's right. Just swell in here, don't you? It hurts. OK. I'm going to try and get your shoe off. OK, pick it around. Steve thinks Nigel's leg is broken. Oh, it's a good leg. He decides to use something to support the leg. What we're going to do is we're going to put this onto your leg, OK? Blow it up, which should make it feel a lot easier. It's like a large plastic boot with a zip up the front. You have to blow this up. 
Just like a balloon. Just like a balloon. Uh, no. Nigel is very brave. He's a good patient. They carry him to the ambulance in a special chair. Inside the ambulance, they lift him onto a bed called a stretcher. covers him with another blanket to keep him warm. The ambulance crew will tell the police where they're taking Nigel. The police will contact his mother. On the way to the hospital, Pat asked Nigel some questions. You confident? Good luck. It's Nigel, isn't it? What's your last name, Nigel? Green. Green. How old are you? You're eight. You can't see into the ambulance from the outside, but the people inside can see out. It's a shame. I bet you're very disappointed. Hey. They've nearly reached the hospital. Okay, you soon be there. It's not far now. Nigel is lifted out of the ambulance on the stretcher. The stretcher has wheels so that it can be pulled along easily. Thank you. Pat and Steve take Nigel to the casualty department. They'll need the ambulance stretcher again, so they lift Nigel onto a hospital trolley. Pat has to let the hospital know that Nigel is there. Now, okay? Steve stays with Nigel. We can actually let the sprint bear know. Okay, I'll try not to hurt you too much. All right, very good lad. Just going to hold your leg, Nigel. Okay, the bottom support. Now he's in hospital. The nurses are in charge. All right then. Now we're going to leave you. All right. See if you've got anything else to do. Just go and find something for me. All right. Now look after yourself. Right. Bye now. It won't be long before Nigel's mum gets here. Have you ever been in hospital? Steve and Pat make sure everything is put back in the ambulance. It may soon be needed again. Nigel is in hospital. 
An ambulance brought him here because he fell downstairs and hurt himself. Nigel's leg is bruised and swollen. It looks as if he's broken a bone in it. All right, Nigel, the doctor will be along in a moment just to examine you. I'm going to have to get you undressed now. If you can just undo your belt. I'm going to remove your trousers. If I just took them off, it would hurt. So I'm just going to have to cut them off for you, all right? The nurse tells Nigel everything that's going to happen, so he won't be worried or frightened. Can you just hold the jumper up for me? And that, that's it. Now the doctor can examine Nigel's lovely. Let's watch him. Hello. Hello. What's your name? Nigel. How old are you, Nigel? Nine. How did you hurt yourself? I've fallen down the stairs. Down stairs. Did you bang your head? Do you feel any pain? No, my leg. Down your leg. What about your head? Any pain in your head? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to have a look at your eyes. All right? That's good. Can you just look straight? The doctor wants to make sure Nigel's head is not badly hurt. He examines Nigel's eyes with a special light. The doctor explains what he's going to do. I'm just going to have a look at your leg. I'm not going to hurt you at all, all right? Can you wiggle your toes for me? It's very good. You feel me touching you? Yes. You feel that? Yes. Feel that? Feel that? Now the doctor will need an X-ray picture very good. to show him Nigel's bones. This is the X-ray machine. It's a special kind of camera. Hello, Nigel. It will photograph the bones in Nigel's head and leg. Pictures of your head, first of all. The person who takes the pictures is called a radiographer. Look at your right hand. That's lovely. That's the film. The radiographer is putting it in a drawer in the table. Keep your head nice and still, darling. She goes behind a screen to work the X-ray machine. She's taking the X-ray picture of Nigel's head. Right, Nigel, that's the picture's finished of your head. Now then we'll take some of your leg. Next, the camera is set up over the place where Nigel's leg is broken. No, I'm just going to pop this under your leg. This time, the radiographer puts the film under Nigel's leg. She makes sure the camera is set properly. Nice and still, Nigel. Listen to the noise of the X-ray machine. These are the pictures the X-ray machine has taken. This one shows the bones in Nigel's head, his skull. There's nothing wrong with that. This X-ray shows the bones in his leg. Can you see where they've broken? Can we undress you now, Nigel? I'll put you into this little gown. By the time Nigel's mum arrives at the hospital, Hello, Nigel. Nigel is in the children's ward. What have you been doing? The sister is getting him ready to have his broken legs set. Hello, are you mother? I am, yes. Oh, lovely. He's not too bad. It looks worse. There are lots of other children in the ward. Some of them are very young. Nigel can see another boy with a bad leg. He's got a special frame to help him walk. Down your light. There's a good lad. Now, I've got some papers to fill in, so you know, can sit with him and have a chat. I was very worried about you. The policeman came round and told me that you'd been brought to hospital. Mum is allowed to sit with Nigel until he's taken to the operating theatre. Have you ever been to the theatre before? No. no. Nothing to worry about. There's some nice people in there now look after you. 
The broken bones in Nigel's leg have got to be fitted together again. Now then, Nigel, I'm going to put this needle in the back of the hand, OK? Here we go, then. He's given something to make him sleep so it doesn't hurt him. All right. Just put a plaster on it, please. That's it. Comfortable? Right. Now we're going to give you an injection, send you off to sleep. The doctor uses a syringe to give the injection. How's that? You feel very sleepy now. The injection works quickly, um, and Nigel goes to sleep at once. A nice dream. The doctor puts a mask on Nigel's nose and mouth. It will help him to breathe during the operation. Can I start the this doctor is the surgeon. He's going to set Nigel's broken leg. A handle winds down the end of the operating table. The surgeon sits down to work. This file says, can you send send back, please? Underneath his name. Lovely. He feels the broken bones with his fingers. He eases them carefully back into the right place. The bones need to be kept in place so that they'll grow together again. So Nigel's leg is put in plaster. First, the surgeon wraps a soft bandage round the leg. One of his helpers gets the special plaster bandage ready. He soaks the bandage in water to wet the plaster. The surgeon wraps the wet bandage round Nigel's leg. As the bandage dries, the plaster will set hard. It will hold the broken bones in place until they grow together again. You're going to be long, obviously. No. Good. Nearly finished, thanks. That's set. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Thank you. Nigel is staying the night at the hospital. His mother can sit by the bed until he wakes up. Now, what I want you to do is stand up. Next morning, Nigel feels fine. Off the floor, right? His leg doesn't hurt much, and he's looking forward to going home. Right. One crutch under the he has to learn to use crutches to help him walk. Right. The sister teaches him. And the same with this one. Now, you push down with your hand. Now, you to take little hops, your crutches first, and move your crutches forward, and a little hop. And again. By the time his family come to take him home, he's so good at using the crutches that he can walk to the car. In a hospital at work, last week he was out with the fire brigade and for his latest report he's joined the ambulance men. Tonight, we're in the capable hands of the West Midlands Metropolitan Ambulance Service. Last year, they moved more than one million patients and clocked up an incredible five million miles with their 300 ambulances and 20 or so backup vehicles. Their thousand men and women are just a telephone's call away. They tend not to make the headlines like the police or fire brigade, perhaps because they've normally left the scene of an incident well before someone like me and my camera crew arrive. But they're always there. 
By the law of averages, most of us will require an ambulance at some time in our lives. And when we want it, we want it fast. I don't think about the incident we go into. I don't get worked up at all, you know, I just go to the incident, that's it, you know. The most important thing is to get to the incident as quickly as you possibly can, but at the back of your mind, you're also trying to um, stop yourself being involved in an accident through hurrying. The voices of ambulanceman Derek Livings and Glyn Gerrard on how they feel when travelling to a treble nine call. And their boss, Assistant Chief Officer Norman Cook, remembers that feeling all too well. I know that I have done 26 years now and I deliberately made an effort when I used to respond to accidents and emergencies to try and keep the conversation in the cab on a level away from the incident so that we didn't arrive there with preconceived ideas of what we might find and then when we got there we found it was totally different. We don't seem to hear much about ambulance men. Is it because you're all very modest or what? I think that's true. Yes, we are very modest. And in fact, I think that uh, unlike some of the services, we have shied away from publicity. But uh, generally, I think people don't think much about the ambulance service until they need one. Glyn Gerrard and Derek Livings are based at the newly opened Money Hall Ambulance Station in Kings Heath, Birmingham. They work a five-week rotor, one week on outpatients, four weeks on accident and emergencies. Do they feel excited answering a 999 call? I think initially you do, but once you start moving, you tend to lose that and you become more involved in your driving. A lot of motorists, when they see an ambulance at the back of them, will apply, you know, apply the brakes and just pull up at the shortest possible distance they can. It would be more use to us if they look for an available gap to themselves and moved into that gap and just moved out of our way gradually. When you respond to a road accident and children are involved, Obviously, the thought on the way is that, uh, you know, could it be my child? You know, we see awful sights, but whatever you do, you're helping out. You know, when we go to the scene of an incident, if the patient is in a very poor condition, we've got the hospital on standby. You know, we've got the nursing team, backup teams, doctors, all on standby to uh, receive this patient. So the whole teamwork is uh, is put together and it works. I think the public. They're relying on you to do something for them, and uh, they're usually panicking. A lot of our work um, involves non-emergency work, where you just go along to the house. Uh, the doctor's made an order for the patient to go into a hospital, and uh, we take the patient in, as we did today with a lady with abdominal pains. Uh, there was no real emergency on the case, um, no blue lights, two turns needed. We just go along pleasant manner take our lady to the hospital and hand her over to the casualty staff. Nowadays, your ambulance man or woman is a trained individual. And very soon, that degree of medical expertise is to be increased. Norman Cook again. Increasingly, we're making demands upon our crew members to operate more and more sophisticated equipment. The concept of the ambulance service was that the patient should be taken to the treatment centre. But I believe now that that pendulum is swinging the other way. And in the foreseeable future, particularly within this ambulance service, the treatment will be taken to the patient. Do you know how many people you might have saved in your 12 years of service? I should imagine hundreds of people. Hundreds of lives? Mm -hmm. You have to be detached. I think there's a, there's a tremendous difference between being detached and being hard. But you do have to be detached because if you get too involved with the incident, generally speaking, I don't think you can perform to the best of your ability. It's a good feeling, the fact that people can trust you that much. It is a rather responsibility. But you, you don't tend to think of that responsibility until afterwards. Can you sleep at night, so after perhaps some horrific incident? Yes. Why? So I've got to get up the next morning. And do it all again? Same again. Will you ever give it up? Not if I can help it. Like the other two emergency organisations, the ambulance service find there are no shortage of recruits just wanting to join. Once they're in, they tend to stay. The last word to Glyn Gerrard, who joined just 18 months ago. I think you try and make the people that you're dealing with feel happier, although this situation is a bad situation. And the only way you can do it is to keep smiling. Will you ever give it up? Not if I can help it. Job for life? Hopefully. John Kane at the sharp end with the ambulance service. Well, still to come, our weekly pop roundup.